So hi, my name is Bob Grunier and I'm a volunteer with Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. I'm here with Max Formichev Zamilov of Maximus Energy Corporation and he is going to give you a presentation which he gave to the Russian community but he's been very kind enough to uh, re-give it here on the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project and that presentation is Nuclear Fusion in Collapsing Cavitation Bubbles Progress and Perspectives. So thank you Max, uh, take it away. All right. Well, Bob, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I presume you all can see my slides, right? Yep. Okay. So I think I've given a talk uh, on your channel maybe uh, two years ago when I initially, I would like to say, you know, made this discovery. And uh, I'm going to tell you what happened in the next, you know, couple of years since I uh, continued this research. But I also want, you know, to give you some history and uh, you know some perspective for people that might be new to this uh, subject because we all heard about you know bubble fusion and you know nuclear fusion allegedly happening in you know, during cavitation so there are some issues that i would like to you know just just to repeat for everyone's sake because my understanding of these issues is a lot better now and I will start with the you know, dynamics of a bubble in a fluid. So if you have a bubble in a liquid and you generate an acoustic field, uh, maybe like a sinusoidal acoustic wave that has cycles of acoustic expansion and acoustic contraction. So the bubble will experience a slow phase of uh, is a thermal expansion when it grows from its ambient radius to its maximum radius. And when the uh, acoustic polarity reverses from expansion to compression, the bubble will undergo slow is a thermal contraction. And that's like the lion's share of the acoustic cycle. So maybe 90% of the time the bubble is slowly is a thermally expanding and then slowly is a thermally collapsing. And it's only during the you know, very final stage of the collapse that's listed here, the, uh, this slow either thermal contraction changes into fast adiabatic collapse. And during the final stage of that collapse, which is like too, too small to indicate here, a shock wave is formed. And that converging shock wave, spherical shock wave, focuses on the bubble core and arguably gives rise to sonoluminescence if the conditions are right. But what happens when that shock wave detaches from bubble surface and focuses on bubble core, it ionizes the gas, it heats the gas, and creates a plasma that's inertially confined by the moving bubble walls. And under the right conditions, we hope we can uh, create temperatures and pressures that are high enough for a new fusion. That's uh, like the common thinking, you know, general idea behind bubble fusion. And the whole process is not really, uh, you know, much different from, you know, much talked about inertial confinement fusion, you know, which is well understood, well researched. We have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of researchers and hundreds of billion, billions of dollars spent in the U.S. and worldwide on, you know, major mainstream inertial confinement fusion, like National Ignition Facility, where you have uh, powerful lasers that focus laser radiation, laser beams on uh, a tiny uh, solid um, deuterium tritium ice pellet and that laser ablates and evaporates the outer layer of the pellet you know forces the compression of the you know remaining uh, bulk of the pellet and uh, under the right conditions you know once again temperatures and pressures are right enough for thermonuclear fusion to take place well we all understand that this is extremely technologically challenging process and it's even more so challenging because it's not enough to focus like 192 lasers on this pellet. You actually need to time them so precisely to, to generate a bunch, you know, sometimes as many as 10, 20, or 30 uh, shock waves that are need to be precisely timed such that all of them arrive at the bubble core at the same time and create temperature and pressure within the core high enough for meaningful amount of thermonuclear reactions to take place. And the reason this is so difficult is because instabilities. When we bash mainstream fusion efforts, we say, oh, plasma is not stable. You know, it's very hard to confine. It just doesn't want to be confined. Either magnetically confined or inertially confined, plasma is unstable. It's hard to confine. Well, uh, 
that's you know one of the motivation why we choose for alternative approaches uh, to fusion. And of course, you know, bubble fusion, you know, when it was f first published by, by Tali Archon, uh, you know, 20 some years ago, of course, it was a sensation because uh, all of a sudden, allegedly, you can do a fusion in a cup, like jar in a star, a star in a jar. And uh, it's very simple. Um, all you have is a glass with a piezo driver around it. But the uh, problem is that th this was not sufficiently studied. So we all know what happened to Teleyarkhan and to his effort. He basically got discredited. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't go into detail, but uh, New Energy Times get a, did a good investigation and, and reported in depth on you know, why <laughs> uh, Teleyarkhan you know, suffered this fate. But uh, making a you know, long story short, is uh, in my personal opinion, I think you know, he did good science and his results are very interesting and very worthwhile of investigation. But because the uh, circumstances were unfortunate, you know, the follow on investigation never happened. So, as, as it stands of today, you know, his results were not independently confirmed. And we all know that in order to, to do science, you know, once you receive a great result and you publish it, and the next step is uh, independent third-party confirmation. And the confirmation that were published by Teleyarkhan student wasn't considered independent because that was, you know, his former student. <laughs> it doesn't quite meet the uh, independent verification standard. Uh, but what happened later was slightly more sad. I, I spoke to people that were involved with the Impulse Devices, which was a California startup that was privately funded to pursue exactly you know, this idea of bubble fusion. So the idea was to, to raise some money from investors and they did raise a considerable amount of money, millions of dollars. And they wanted to build a commercial power generating you know, reactor based on bubble fusion, based off you know, Teleyarkhan's ideas. And the founder of that company, Ross Tishian, he actually hired Teleyarkhan and gave him, well, for the lack of a better word, you know, blank check, to reproduce you know, his results at, uh, at Impulse Devices Lab in California. And Teleyarkhan went back and forth and tried you know, very hard to reproduce his own results, and he couldn't. And to me, that's a very troubling sign. So he was very motivated because he was already under pressure, under the gun, you know, being discredited by a researcher's community. And here he had this opportunity at someone else's dime to vindicate himself, you know, basically replicate, you know, his own results at a third party lab, at a third party company and, you know, clear his good name. And despite all of the money and uh, time and effort, he couldn't. Well, it didn't stop impulse devices. They were able to get a grant on earmark, like 30 million earmark from DOD to further pursue, you know, this uh, cavitation based fusion approach. And they developed a rather nice uh, resonator, which is, was about you know, 20 inches in diameter. Uh, I mean, uh, 20 centimeters, I think, in diameter, or well, maybe 30 centimeters in diameter, and was able to um, produce a standing acoustic wave in the hundreds, hundreds of atmospheres, maybe as high as a thousand atmospheres. And they were able to film the bubble that formed you know, within the middle of that chamber, which was filled with water initially. And despite spending 30 millions and years on that research, they didn't observe any fusion. And they went as far as to fill the chamber with liquid gallium, you know, which is, of course, you know, far better for inertial confinement. And they even introduced deuterium-tritium mixture inside and still did not detect fusion. So that tells me that you know, our arch nemesis instability uh, affects uh, bubble collapse just uh, in the same way as it affects inertial confinement fusion. And, and lo and behold, uh, we all know that when bubble collapses, it's nearly impossible to maintain you know, the sphericity of collapse. Even the slightest you know, variation in the acoustic field, you know, the gravity, Earth gravity alone is enough to, um, to change the perfect symmetry of the collapse. And in the final stage, bubble almost always develops a cavitation jet, which you can see on this picture. 
And the results from impulse devices also indicate that, you know, the cavitation jet was developed uh, during the final stage of collapse, regardless of how well they were trying to focus the shock wave. It's, you know, the same old, you know, instability problem. Uh, no matter how hard you try, you get instabilities and, you know, you cannot just easily, perfectly focus a shock wave at the bubble core. That's why we need to look for something else. And that was, you know, one of the motivations, you know, for my own research. When I started working on bubble fusion, I wanted to see what else I can do. Maybe I shouldn't work, you know, just with a singular bubble like everybody else. Maybe I should work with multiple bubbles. Maybe I should try uh, various fluids, you know, various conditions. So I decided to be creative because the, uh, you know, common well-treaded road didn't seem lead to result. But before I started, I realized that, you know, in order to measure anything, I need to learn, you know, first about measurement. So I spent, you know, several years on uh, researching how to measure neutrons. And as an outcome of that research, I developed my own hardware software system, which I call Automated Nuclear Lab. It's a, it's a hardware system that allows you to acquire a signal from detectors, multiple detectors in real time and, and do real time pulse processing, digital filtering in order to count pulses. So I had to develop software that came with it, which I called Pulse Counter Pro. And at the end of this day, this spectroscopy software, you know, gives you a plot, you know, which is a pulse height or, you know, pulse energy spectrum and various other data, such as, you know, rise time distribution, pulse width distribution, you know, countries and whatnot. And I use these tools extensively to be able to show that, um, you know, when, when you deploy this system, you can conclusively show above background excesses in neutron or gamma counts on the order of a few percent. So, you know, once I was satisfied, you know, with the quality of, of this instrumentation, I applied it to, you know, to my own research. Oh, and uh, I also chose um, uh, thermal neutron detectors, detector tubes, which are proportional counters filled, you know, with helium-3. And the reason I, I chose it, uh, there were two reasons. One is this is the highest sensitivity detector because helium-3 out of uh, common substances has the highest cross-section for absorb absorbing thermal neutrons. And the other reason was it gives a very characteristic thermal neutron spectrum, which you can see here. And, you know, one of the theses that I put forward that in order to reliably detect low levels of neutron radiation, you need to show that your spectrum builds up to a thermal neutron spectrum because that's, you know, one of the key data points. It's not, it's not sufficient in my mind just to count neutrons, because when you count neutrons, you cannot tell whether your pulses look legitimate or whether you count in noise. But if your spectrum builds up to a recognizable shape, such as a thermal neutron spectrum shape, then you can make a strong argument that what you're counting is neutrons and not electromagnetic noise or some other noise, because it's very unlikely that, you know, some other noise that you're counting is going to produce your thermal neutron spectrum. So that's why I chose uh, helium three field proportional counters because they give this unmistakable thermal neutron shape, you know, when the, the neutrons are counted properly. And that, that's one of the key indicators I rely upon. So on this picture, you can see the uh, experimental setup that I've built. So the heart of that setup is a reactor, which was initially a stainless steel in a chamber, which uh, uh, were, was a uh, flanged assembly, six inch in diameter. And lately, I replaced it, you know, with a glass-based assembly, which was also flange, also, you know, six-inch diameter. But regardless, um, to the bottom flange, there is a piezoelectric transducer, Branson Sunnyfire piezoelectric transducer uh, that runs at 20 kilohertz, which was affixed uh, to the bottom flange and, and emitting acoustic waves inside that chamber, which was filled with oil. So I used a uh, uh, um, multi-therm heat exchange oil, which is basically a vacuum oil with very low vapor pressure. Um, and uh, also within that chamber was a PCB transducer, which I used to read the acoustic signature of, of the sound waves that the uh, piezo driver uh, was producing. In the back of that chamber, I had a bunch of uh, neutron tubes that you saw on the previous slide, and some borax to screen uh, background neutrons. And uh, I also had an auxiliary, auxiliary um, uh, circulation loop uh, connected to the reactor, so I could filter the oil, so I could uh, inject bubbles you know, using a Venturi nozzle. 
And I also have a secondary cavitation chamber that's listed here. So there were two sources of cavitation. I could cavitate in the secondary chamber, which was outside in this external loop. So when the pump was pumping oil through it and then returning it to the reactor. And I also could cavitate you know, within the reactor and, and, and both. And of course, the whole thing was connected to a vacuum pump. So I could evacuate it to a very you know, low vacuum uh, and experiment with a wide range of parameters. So that's the system I used for nearly three years. And I uh, primarily ran oil, uh, this multi-therm oil, and I tried injecting in a deuterium. Oh, and I also had this in you know, a laser system in the back with a separate you know, circulation loop so I could run my, uh, my oil through the laser and look at the bubble distribution. You know, what bubble sizes am I getting? So I experimented with various you know, concentration of deuterium bubbles under various pressures. And I also tried you know, mixing uh, deuterium and xenon because Seth Potterman of UCLA published uh, along with his students a very interesting paper that if you inject uh, xenon, then um, um, mass uh, segregation occurs as xenon forms a very powerful uh, shock wave that rams the remaining deuterium within the bubble very strongly towards the center of the bubble. And I was very you know, interested in that idea. So I tried mixing deuterium and xenon. Uh, so I tried all of that, but unfortunately, I have never gotten any excess counts, uh, you know, beyond background. So as I said, I run thousands of experiments under various pressures, you know, various flow rates, various bubble sizes, you know, various concentrations, you know, various driving pressures uh, of uh, piezo acoustic transducer. And this is, you know, how my typical null result looks. Uh, me in my pulse counter software. So here is a history of counts. So red bars are experimental counts and blue bars are background counts. So when uh, the reactor is turned on, you know, these counts are colored red. And when the re reactor is turned off, meaning, you know, there is no sound, you know, the bar is count blue. And uh, with my uh, measures that I took to screen background nutrients by deploying borax boxes to absorb environmental nutrients, I was getting maybe like four or five or six, you know, counts per minute. And as you can see in a typical null result, so I run 100 experiments and each experiment lasts uh, 10 minutes in this case. And my average count rate is, you know, three, four, five, six counts per minute. And there isn't a big difference between, you know, background and experiment. In fact, I would argue there is no difference <laughs> whatsoever. And uh, this is how a typical sound the reactor looked like. I was able to produce acoustic intensities on the order of you know, a few atmospheres. And with some efforts, you know, it could be uh, 10 atmospheres. So pretty much in line with what Tully Arkin you know, was reporting. And granted, my uh, acoustic uh, pressures were different in different parts of the reactor. So this is like from the center of the reactor. So there were parts where pressures were higher and lower, but you know this is like a well well representative, uh, I would say, uh, not exactly average, but well representative picture of what the acoustic looks like. So it's, it's a sinusoidal, you know, oscillation, and the reason it's not continuous is because I couldn't operate that piezoelectric driver, even even though it was 500 watts. You know, the power supply was connected to was not able to sustain 500 watts when this whole thing, you know, was mounted to, to the reactor. It was just uh, emitting too much energy overloading uh, the, the power supply. So I chose to operate it in a pulsed mode. So I was running it in a, in a pulsed mode with a duty cycle of about 20 milliseconds. So 20 milliseconds, the sound was on. It would develop this acoustic wave. And then for the next 20 milliseconds, there was no sound. The reactor, the power supply was resting and recharging. And then, you know, this whole thing was repeating. But the, uh, the frequency of sound was 20 kilohertz fixed. So I was kind of discouraged with all of this, and it led me to believe that these instabilities that, that do form probably prevent bubbles from collapsing symmetrically enough for, you know, for the shock wave to focus uh, in the middle of the bubble to where I can generate a uh, you know, meaningful amount of fusion. And I tried, you know, very, very hard to detect it. So I said, okay, I'm going to be creative. Let me try something else. So what I tried was I introduced, you know, D2O in the reactor. So I poured some heavy water into the reactor. 
And very quickly, it formed an emulsion that you can see on this picture. And uh, when it formed this emulsion, I started seeing uh, the acoustics change dramatically. So this is my typical uh, sound wave inside the reactor. But at some point, it starts developing this, these massive spikes. You know, these massive spikes that were so strong they saturated the uh, piezoelectric microphone I used to detect the sound. Yeah, and these acoustic peaks were in the thousands of atmospheres. So my typical average you know, wave was just you know, a couple of atmospheres, but these peaks went on into thousands of atmospheres, saturated the microphone, occasionally destroy, destroyed the microphone, and occasionally they compounded so much to where the glass in the viewport cracked. So this happened several times. And I cannot even imagine what kind of acoustic magnitude you need to have to crack this massive you know, vacuum <laughs> uh, quartz in a window that was, uh, you know, the viewport in, in the reactor. But that did happen a few times. So I said, okay, you know, that's, that's interesting. I've never observed that before. So let me see, you know, what kind of neutron flux I'm getting. So, and when I, you know, turned on, you know, my neutron detector, I started registering, you know, counts 100 to 1,000 times in excess of background. So before, you know, for many months, my counts were consistent with background and the count rate was in you know, a four or five counts per minute. And here, all of a sudden, they have in you know, a 1,500, 2,000, you know, 3,000 counts per minute. And, and every experiment, like almost every experiment, I was logging raw detector signal because I'm a skeptic. I need to be sure that what I'm counting is indeed neutrons and not electromagnetic noise. The spectrum doesn't look like thermal neutron spectrum, so I want to expand the signal to see. The signal looks good to me. HD, you see here, it's, it's a neutron event, or what looks like a neutron event. And there are a bunch of them. In fact, there are so many of them, it's hard to resolve individual counts to form a spectrum. So I needed to, uh, to do a little change of strategy. I figured that my emulsion was too dense, so I decided to dilute it. Uh, so I don't get you know, so many neutrons, so I can actually build a thermal neutron spectrum. And you know, once I diluted my emulsion, I was able to zoom in on, onto the signal, and I see that a bit of uh, electromagnetic noise from piezo acoustic driver bleeds into my uh, neutron detector bank. So each um, uh, packet, packet here that you see is actually electromagnetic noise due to capacitive coupling between the uh, detector bank and the piezoelectric driver. But this coupling was fortuitous because it allowed me to see easily when the sound was on. So when the sound was on, you know, this capacitive coupling took place, which gives me this noise on the detector signal. And I see that most of my neutrons are actually coincident with this noise. So it turns out that, you know, most of my neutrons are emitted when the detect, uh, when the uh, piezoelectric driver was energized because it was operated in a pulsed mode. And, and you can see it here too. I actually uh, do have some gamma events, but I reject them. Uh, because every um, neutron detector will also detect gamma, so you need to set up a discrimination level, and you say, well, below this level, you don't count events, but above that level, you do. So anything below you know, 2.5 millivolts in this example, I consider as gammas, and I reject everything above, I consider neutrons, and I count. So you know, I took those measures too, and of course, I also worked on get rid of this capacitive coupling, so I introduced a grounded copper plate between the detector and the reactor to completely you know, eliminate this, this coupling. But I'm glad I, I had it because it allowed me to establish a correlation between neutrons and sound. And you know, once I established it, I eliminated the coupling. And my next objective was, well, I ought to get a thermal neutron spectrum. So I operated the reactor for an hour. And uh, during an hour, uh, gradually and slowly, the perfect thermal neutron spectrum built up, which you can see on this picture. And that you know, completely convinced me that what I'm counting is uh, neutrons, it's not electromagnetic interference. So I got rid of capacitive coupling, the neutron signal looked perfect, looked clear. I was able to get you know, a thermal neutron spectrum out of it that looks very nice. And, and the reactor was running for an hour. And in this mode, I was able to run you know, this reactor for about four or five months. So I would introduce a couple of milliliters of emulsion into my reactor, and I would start you know, detecting uh, neutrons, which were maybe like 10 times in excess of background, maybe 20 times in excess of background. And this is you know, how my typical counts looked like. 
So on, on the top picture, you see I ran counts overnight. So I figured, okay, well, let me see what counts look overnight. And, and, and here it's counts per second, actually, switch from counts per minute to counts per second. But you know, if you convert to counts per minute, maybe you get like three counts per minute overnight. And then uh, when I turn my reactor on, counts start increasing gradually. And the longer the reactor is on, you know, they build up more and more and more. Uh, and on the picture here, you can see that you know, some of the events are registered were well, actually, actually multiple events. So this is a triple, if not quadruple event. So the neutrons are spaced so closely, you cannot resolve them very well, but that was a common occurrence, which tells me that that's not a random process that was probably you know, acoustically mediated because, uh, as I said, neutrons were coincident with sound. So sound was instrumental in getting these neutrons to happen. And very often they happened in this, you know, tightly correlated bunches, which, you know, I couldn't resolve. And then I captured a plot that looked like this. So I turned my reactor on and my neutron signal builds up, builds up, builds up. Then I turned the reactor off to show the correlation that actually, you know, can control it. And, you know, much to my surprise, the gowns did not return to baseline instantaneously. Instead, they took their time. And each measurement here, here is a few minutes. So we're talking maybe like three minute measurement. So each bar is three measurement long in time. So it took what, almost like, you know, 15, 20 minutes for the counts to return to baseline. And I turned the reactor on again and the counts gradually built up. I turned the reactor off, they gradually died down. And you see, you know, this pattern I was able to repeat several times. So it really blew my mind. I didn't know what to think. You know, when you say something like this uh, and you expect a conventional explanation in terms of you know, acoustically mediated thermonuclear fusion, it just doesn't fit. Because when you turn the sound off, the neutrons must disappear instantaneously because there is no sound, there is no bubble oscillation. So where would the fusion neutrons come from? So for many, uh, let's say for two years, I've never told anyone about this result because it was so confusing to me. Uh, you know, I didn't know what to think of it. So you know, here it is, uh, make sense of it. But but here is what I learned later. So during uh, you know this four months that I was able to operate the reactor, uh, the reactor eventually quit operating because of the emulsion I used separated. So I, uh, I had a bucket full of this emulsion that looked cloudy and I would draw uh, a few milliliters, actually one milliliter of, of that emulsion and deposit it in the reactor for experiment. And I was able to do it for four or five months, but one day I look in my bucket and, and the oil looks clear, and, but there is sediment at the bottom. So the, you know something happened, the emulsion separated. So I said, okay, well, let me make a, a new bucket. So the next you know, year, actually two years, I spent on trying to mix a new emulsion. And I was pretty sure it was, you know, this heavy water that I added that, that made it work. So I was adding, you know, various concentrations of heavy water and making emulsions and I couldn't get it to work. So I'm thinking, you know, well, what's wrong? You know, why is this not working? You know, why was it working and why is it not working now? And I was so hell bent on this idea of it was heavy water, it was heavy water, it was heavy water that I was totally blind to everything else that was going on. It is only, you know, a few months ago that, uh, well, let's say, I opened up my mind wide enough to read my own experimental notes carefully enough and realize that <laughs> it wasn't just heavy water. I also had titanium deuteride powder that ended up uh, in my um, emulsion by accident. In one of my, ex in, in, not in one, in, in a few of my experiments, I actually experimented with, with a mixture of uh, heavy water and uh, titanium deuteride powder that was prepared uh, for me by Alan Smith. So he made some powder for me, he made it through an electrolysis process. And uh, in, in one of the experiments, before I detected any neutrons, I said, okay, well, let me try mixing some of that powder with heavy water and cavitating it, and I didn't detect any neutrons from it, so I dumped it <laughs> into my uh, oil bucket, and that, where it became emulsion, where it became a heavy water emulsion with some admixture of titanium deuteride powder, you know, which I later introduced in, in the reactor, and that's you know when the magic started happening, because I look at my experiment notes, and it's only when the emulsion had this uh, titanium deuteride contamination, so suspension, basically, a suspension of titanium deuteride, 
I had uh, neutron emission, above background neutron emission. And every time where I had pure deuterium or pure deuterium oxide or heavy water and no titanium deuteride powder, you know, I never had this uh, neutron emission. So I said, okay, well, let me try uh, introducing titanium deuteride powder. So I introduced it back and still ne no neutron emission. I'm like, what the hell? And then they realized, oh, well, I don't get neutrons either when my acoustic signature is not in the thousands of atmospheres. And it was not easy to, um, to work up the reactor to, to that mode when it starts producing these massive acoustic peaks. So in this uh, November and October of last year, I spent you know, a couple of months trying to work out you know, this technique of how do I you know, go about you know, building the resonance inside the reactor such that I get these massive acoustic peaks you know, yet again. And I was successful at that. Uh, I started detecting you know, these massive acoustic peaks and it destroyed my uh, piezoelectric microphone. So I had to stop you know, the work because I couldn't you know, measure the sound anymore and order another one, which came in you know, just recently. And now I'm very eager you know, to resume the experiments because I believe the two missing ingredients you know, to, to the successful production of neutrons, which I was overlooking over the past you know, two years, is uh, titanium deuteride powder and these massive acoustic peaks. So now I know how to produce these massive acoustic peaks. Now I can introduce the titanium deuteride powder, and hopefully I will get uh, this neutron emission again. So what makes the process a bit more you know, complicated is that I don't know the re requisite concentration or bubble size, droplet size for the emulsion, and I don't know the requisite concentration or the particle size for the titanium deuteride suspension. But I do believe that uh, both are necessary, and I do believe that uh, you know, with some effort, hopefully, I can get you know, the neutron uh, signal again. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know whether my neutrons are thermonuclear in origin or spallation or maybe some other nuclear process. You know, that, that remains uh, you know, to be seen. So I'm expecting some, you know, some hard work ahead. <laughs> it's probably not going to be a, an easy you know, replication of my own results. So I know my results were repeatable because I was able to sustain neutron emission for many months. So the emulsion was stable for many months. So now I need to recreate that emulsion and the missing ingredient was titanium deuteride powder, as well as uh, you know, the high enough acoustic intensity. So that's on my to-do list for this year. And uh, I also started working on, uh, on solid titanium deuteride powder. So I tried uh, acoustically compressing them using the uh, ultrasonic horn and uh, basically pounding on this powder in, in, in a pestle in a solid state. And that gave me you know, some interesting results, some very encouraging results. I'm uh, very, very interested in pursuing this titanium uh, deuterium line, which I never thought I would end up with. But, but this is, I guess, what happens. Uh, so so the, the bigger lesson here is I started with a preconceived notion that I can make fusion happen within the collapsing bubbles. And something to that nature happened, but because my notion was preconceived, I thought I knew you know, the recipe. I you know, refused to look at other factors that were staring in my face. And that's kind of an advice to um, other researchers. When we start an experiment, it's best not to have any preconceived notions because these notions end up holding us back and costing us time, effort, and frustration. And it's only when I was able you know, to expand my mind and, and look more broadly and look at the inconvenient data point that, well, I like those ones where the uh, you know, signal was going up and down that I couldn't make sense. It, it only started clicking then. So I can appreciate you know, how hard it is for mainstream academics or for any you know, kind of researcher, we all have our ideas and we're blinded by our ideas. So it's very hard to let them go. So I never thought I would end up in a, you know, what's considered a cold fusion area or solid state in a nuclear fusion. But that's uh, you know, where this road took me. And I had a very you know, mainstream mindset, uh, you know, very mainstream set of ideas, but everything points to that titanium, deuterium is the key ingredient and I'm determined to research it more. And um, I want to make a promise to myself. I will try not to, you know, limit my imagination, and, and try to discard experimental data that doesn't fit my, you know, my own ideas and 
maybe the work will go a bit easier, but you know, that's all I have to say. So thank you very much for, uh, for your <laughs> consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, uh, Max, for that excellent presentation. I'm sure our listeners will be very happy to hear that. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of uh, points and questions. Um, uh, obviously, the story about Teliarkin is uh, very sad, and it had a terrible conclusion, really. Um, mm. uh, it's very well documented, as you say, on Stephen Krivitz's New Energy Times. I encourage people to go and see the story there. Um, you yeah, I would like to just add a quick note to it. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, that story boils down to academic politics. You know, yes. it's been talked a lot about recently that unfortunately academia has become become became a very difficult environment for researchers to operate because they all need, need to chase grant funding and there is fierce competition, uh, ruthless competition. So you make one misstep and you know your competitors seize on the opportunity. You know, to destroy your career because if you get funding, they don't, and that's you know one of the reasons I decided not to pursue research in academia. And that was one of the reasons why Einstein advised people to have a cobbler's job. He said, you know, making a discovery is too much to expect from a young person or anyone for that matter. So get a cobbler job and pursue science you know, in your spare time, and that that way you don't have the stress or pressure. Um, and that's, you know, I think how we should go about it. Yeah, I mean, what, what you've identified in your work is that even when you are the expert in your own experiment, mm -hmm. you can miss yeah. something. And if you're not a good note taker, if you're not a good logbook uh, writer, then you wouldn't have even been able to rediscover what potentially was the cause of uh, you not being able to see these neutrons. Yeah, again. yeah. In, in fact, let me add a note to it. I think uh, it's very good to have a, a collaborator to work with, because you know, when you are you know, the sole person, you take notes about what you think is important. And that was my problem, because I, I recorded what I thought was important. So I didn't record things that I didn't think were important. And things I didn't think were important things that didn't align with my vision. So when you have somebody else you know, who has no like stake in any of the intellectual ideas, take notes, they actually record everything, everything they see without, you know, making a judgment, you know, whether this is important or not. Whereas, you know, when you're, when you're yourself, the judge, you know, it's this inescapable and a filter of psychology. Oh, this is not important. I, and, it's uh, exactly the reason the MFMP works the way it does is what we found was when we were working with Francesco Cellani, he was very, very good at providing us the active material, so we didn't have to worry about whether it was produced in the right way. Whatever idiosyncrasies went into producing that, we didn't have to worry about that. We got what he thought was the active material. Then um, we found out we had some issues, and we, we, we kind of came up with some ideas of what they might be due to. We went back to Francesco, and he says, oh, yes, yes, you should have done that. And oh, oh yes, yes, you should have done that. So we found that even with working with a, a, a claimant, because they do things so automatically in their line of work, it's not even something they record in the logbook, and it's not even something they're right. going to tell you unless you kind of work out that maybe there's something missing with, and, and you work it out by accident, and you, <laughs> and then it's revealed. So that is part of why, um, and, and people find it a little bit odd sometimes that we actually video preparing a piece of material, like everything we've done, we capture that on video, and sometimes I've had these conversations with researchers and say, well, why do I need to do that? I'm just doing this and that and the other. And I said, well, it, you might be doing something that is not even obvious when you're doing it to yourself, not even obvious to someone when they're watching it. But you, someone thinks they know how to do what you did because they're looking at it in a recipe written in text, but you, they've missed something that you've done. And so this is why we're quite um, obsessive about just videoing things, uh, because it, it like puts co-collaborators in the room when you're doing something, but in the future. <laughs> so that's important. You know, very good point. And, and, and actually, when I'm looking to replicate something or even to discuss something, I revisit those videos um, because even my memory of what I did is completely gappy. And so by having it documented, it's like a, having the video there is like its own logbook. Yeah, I, I will tell you, I had to go into hypnotherapy, try to remember some of the things, you know, I've done during the experiment. 
<laughs> it, it helps, you know, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's 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 uh, that's very interesting that you chose to do that because, like, it, it must be very frustrating, and I imagine it must be for Teliarkin to not be able to, and un, in his case, as you notify, uh, uh, noted, that he was under pressure. Um, right. But, you know, if you change one parameter in the system, like the thickness of the glass, or you change the type of metal or the thickness of the metal or the coupling means between the transducer and, and the chamber... All these things can affect things. One thing I learned from Suhas Ralkar, who is and was an extreme expert in ultrasonics, is mm -hmm. it's all to do with the coupling of the ultrasonic transducer to the device that you are processing. And right. if you do not get your horn the right mass and the right shape for mm -hmm. the wave transmission, and mm -hmm. the chamber is not the right resonant cavity, and it's right. and the fluid that's in there has the wrong load on the uh, uh, the overall system. It's just not going to work. And you right. only need to have a ninety five less than ninety five percent transmission of the sound energy into the s sample that's meant to be absorbing it, and you have some reflection back in the transducer, and the transducer starts to degrade really rather rad rapidly. And then you're assuming your transducer has a particular output of sound. And it, it, meanwhile, it's it's getting less and less and less. And so you're not even able to achieve what you would. And you just you can't even see that the transducer's fallen apart. And it's not working the same way. What I found <laughs> with um, uh, the ultra experiment, which is obviously a very simple experiment, is that if I had the ultrasonic mic, the 384 kilohertz mic, um, recording the frequency output from the overall system as I poured in different levels of water, it completely shifts the resonant frequency, right? Mm -hmm. So it because it's changing the load on the transducer because the water depth is changing. And that would change if you had a temperature change or if you had a mixed emulsion like you did or a mixed emulsion with, with metals in it. In each of these cases, the temperature, the type of fluid, whether it's a combination of fluids, whether it's got gases in there, whether it has gases synthesized in there, whether it has solids in there, all of these things will be changing the frequency. And it's not just changing the frequency, it's changing the harmonics of the frequency. And it might actually be a harmonic that's doing the work rather than mm. the actual fundamental. And, and it's Yeah, a, it's a exactly. Gun. That's what I uh, also noticed with my you know, bubbles when there's massive acoustic peaks develop, it's not due to the uh, you know, main <laughs> main frequency. It's some weird interplay of, of harmonics and some weird interplay of the short waves that the rebounding bubbles create. So it's a really constructive interference of the rebounding bubbles. That is exactly the right phrase to use here because it, you may find that it's actually, it's actually the shock wave that sends out, that actually sends a pulse that comes back mm -hmm. And that is actually at the resonant frequency of the chamber, not the input sound. The sound is actually just a, you're seeing an emergent phenomena from the input energy. Um, yeah, it's a hammer, you know. Yeah, it's, you yeah, it's, it's, you're hitting it with a very, so, so what I can see is when some people replicate the ultra experiment, they either change, the depth of the water is not right, or they don't have the means to reflect it. So you get the phase conjugation and you get the actual uh, resonant standing waves. Now, if you imagine that your fluid has a particular viscosity and it has a particular uh, shear strength and it, the vapor pressure of the particular material is such that these factors combine together so that you can't get the slamming of the bubble or that your actual driving frequency is not at the frequency that will grow the bubble and then slam it at the right time, you might not even have the right amount of time to allow the bubble to slam before you're giving it the next pulse. And so, you know, these things. Now, the second point that I think is really interesting is when you add a conductive metal in there, you're adding something with three electrons on the surface. That's one thing. And when what I've established is very important in these systems is that when you have a conductive fluid, let's say water, and I know in your case it might not be conductive, but that will produce um, a... Um, easy water you have some charge separation arguably you could say you've got free electrons and whether there's any shear relationship pulling it into a vortex structure i don't know but these actually produce electrodynamic and magneto uh, uh, hydrodynamic structures on metals when you have in in the case water i think if you're adding you are adding d2o right mm -hmm. so you've got water in there 
So you could very reasonably be creating magnetohydrodynamic structures that are only existent when you have the metal particles. Because that's when you get the free electrons that cause the easy water out the easy water component of the water component that's in the fluid. Then secondly, you've got a multi-phase system. There's all kinds of complexities with that that needs to be considered. I think the first one you need to hit is to probably get um, one of these high frequency microphones and do a study where you're changing the fluid depth and just see what the difference in resonance is. Because you mm -hmm. may find that your sweet spot is only within a, having a certain amount of fluid and, and between a very narrow band. And you may find that that changes as soon as it heats up. Because in the case of Bing Jiren Huang, and uh, I, I've been mentioning recently Cladoff, which I know you've had some experience of, um, basically, if you, if you change the temperature, all of the parameters change. And if you go below the right parameter space, and if you go above the right parameter space, you literally do not see the effect. And that's because you don't get the correct slamming of the bubbles. So you've got timing of the slamming of the bubbles, which is highly dependent on temperature, shear strength, the, the, the uh, viscosity, obviously it's related to shear strength. You've got um, the, the vapor pressure. All of these things. Now, you also showed some very nice diagrams of the reentrant jet. What mm -hmm. I find that the reentrant jet is actually something that is the same magnetohydrodynamic structure. In fact, they, the, the, if you bring that up now, that actually does produce a uh, soliton, a toroidal soliton. And there's been a lot of different photography showing that that can lead to the soliton. Also, if you have two impinging rare refraction pulses through a fluid, they will also create a soliton. Now, if you can create a scenario where you've got these resonant standing waves and they're constantly driving a soliton in a particular location, then that can build and build and build the energy. And that might explain why you see this ramping up of uh -huh. the neutron flux. It also might be that you might need to first synthesize oxygen in your fluid because you're starting with d2o that's in the fluid and um you've added the d2o as i understand it with the titanium deuteride and right. it's it's the three that makes the magic source in the working fluid of the oil yeah the, the technical term is deuterated titanium powder so yeah. uh, it got you know corrected by people saying well um yeah. when you have bulk titanium only the surface forms titanium deuteride and because you know that powder was not characterized uh, properly, you know the proper term is uh, deuterated titanium powder. Right. Okay. So you know has some titanium. titanium powder. So um, and then you have um, deuterium oxide in there, and the deuterium oxide will, yeah, under these circumstances, uh, it will um, hom homogeneously or heterogeneously split up. And in mm -hmm. some cases, that will leave free, free radical uh, oxygen. The oxygen will then become O2. And so it might need you to start synthesizing O2 to get to a point where you have the, 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 um, the overall structures in there that are necessary to produce the, the effect. Uh, might I suggest you potentially considering adding some uh, magnetic particles in there as well? Um, it, it, again, it's going to change... Lots okay. of parameters. Any particular particles? Sorry? Or just iron? Any particular well, type of... Well, obviously, the best ma magnetic particle is normally uh, iron powder. Um, it's going to end okay. up as rust, but rust is also magnetic. So right. um, okay. it's how much more magnetic is, is oxides of iron over and above um, the paramagnetic nature of oxygen. But I, I, th mm -hmm. I think that's probably a, um, a good potential. One, it's going to... Um, it's not a good means of grabbing the um, uh, the deuterium. It's not. It's not going to absorb the deuterium. It's basically a brick, like a brick wall, um, and um, it's it's also a conductive material. It's not that conductive, but it allows for um, this same process to go on. So um, now, so it, it's kind of like how do you know you have enough time for making and slamming the bubbles in the process? Um, mm. and, and this is just where it needs systematic study after systematic study. So firstly, you've got to get your fluid right so that it works every time. And I think that's where you, the, the line you're on right, right now. Right. And then it's, it's down to how do you get that to um, you optimize yeah. it. Right. So on that note, is, uh, my next objective is to be able to 
re replicate you know my own experiments so i can get the neutron flux you know going every time yeah, yeah. once again and then I, as you said i can systematically study and determine you know what what really makes it happen what yeah. are the necessary conditions yeah, yeah you know which would amount to useful information that you know i can pass along to other researchers it could you know work uh, you know with the same effect and following you know the steps that i discovered and you know derive their own knowledge and, and their own conclusions so that's in my mind, what is the science is about? We need to teach each other, yes. you know, these recipes, you know, yes, absolutely. which steps absolutely. do we need to take in order to get, you know, the same result. And, and then once and everybody is able to get the same result, you know, we all can study it and and understand it. How, how do you maintain a specific temperature in your reactor? It's just sheer, um, uh, what do you call it, thermal inertia. It's large. <laughs> It's it's a large chunk of steel with with a lot of uh, oil in it, so it, for the most part maintains this temperature natural. I didn't take specific efforts in trying to heat or cool it. It does get a little warmer throughout uh, the process. And what I observed is, um, so when I start the experiment and the neutron signal is building up, it would last for about you know an hour or maybe two hours, and then it would quit. And I was trying to figure out why was it quitting because the oil was warming up and eventually, or because the headspace pressure was uh, increasing, because you know, all of those parameters are are important. But um, for a while, I thought it was the headspace pressure because I was starting with maybe like a few tours, maybe two or three tours of headspace above oil, and then uh, my uh, neutron flux would quit when the uh, headspace pressure would reach 18, 20 tour. And I thought, well, that's an interesting figure because that's the partial pressure of uh, of water at room temperature. Yeah. It's exactly like 20 torr. I thought, well, um, and that's actually what what took me on this wrong turn, being so damn sure it was uh, water droplets. Because I thought, well, maybe when I drop my headspace pressure to um, just two or three torrs, my water droplets expand and become bubbles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. why I thought that the uh, my oil was also heavily oxidized, you know, from all of the experiments. It was yellow, it was no longer clear, it was yellow and greenish in color, so it had some copper soap in it, and maybe some other contaminants, maybe some borax, you know, went into it because I had just so much of it. So I was, my hypothesis was that this oxidization of oil and the contaminants of borax or something else and copper soap that formed because it had copper gaskets created a surfactant. And what I had was um, heavy water droplets that were coated with surfactant. So when I was dropping the headspace pressure, those droplets turned into water vapor bubbles, which you know wouldn't condense because pressure was below the uh, partial vapor pressure of water at room temperature. Yeah, and the surfactant on the surface of the bubble, you know, prevented the surface tension from from keeping you know the bubble together. That's why I was sure, you know, it was. Droplet, because when it was reaching, you know, 20 tor, ish, you know, 8 into 20 tor, the, the process was stopping. And I was saying, okay, well, it's because at that temperature, I have uh, that pressure, I have enough pressure for the uh, water vapor droplet bubble to condense back into droplets. So it, it quits working. But, you know, that could have been a coincidence, could also be, you know, the factor that the temperature of oil, you know, within the reactor was reaching you know, gradually increasing from room temperature to maybe, you know, 30, 35 C, you know, to body temperature. And uh, I also conveniently overlooked the fact that, you know, the biggest neutron signal that I got, it's it's one again, the psychological thing. When you see something inconvenient, doesn't fit your picture, you discard it, right? So I discarded this, you know, oscillating, you know, behavior. And I discarded the fact that my strongest neutron signal was an actual atmospheric pressure. You know, when I had a lot of uh, fluid in my reactor, a lot of heavy water, and, you know, I didn't evacuate any of the headspace, so it was atmospheric pressure. Uh, but that didn't fit my picture, so I chose to forget about it and then focus on what, you know, fit my theory. <laughs> so you're quite right. You know, everything is important, and it will take some some effort, you know, once I have can, the repeatable Can I, can I ask you to bring up um, your diagram of your apparatus? way here we go uh and you need to share the screen because i'm only seeing oh, okay. right now. Um, uh, well, let me figure this out 
Actually, it says I'm sharing my screen. Oh, it does. Hmm. Okay. Why would that be? It says I'm sharing the screen, so can you see it? No, I can't. I can see you and me now. Well, let me stop sharing and let me restart sharing. Hold on. Is this stop sharing? Okay, start sharing. Start sharing. Hmm. Oh, yes, that looks better. Right. Okay. So essentially you have the piezo at the bottom, the fluid, mm -hmm. and then a volume of um, gas above. Right, which I call headspace. Yeah. So what I might suggest, and I don't know how complicated this would be for your device, is for you to insert a hard mirror, uh, quite a thick uh, section, in mm -hmm. part of the headspace directly mm -hmm. above the transducer and immersed in the fluid that you mm -hmm. can then lever, uh, raise and lower. And what this will do yeah. is it will create a, a means by which you can create standing waves in there. Yeah, that's a very good idea. This is exactly what we find with the ultra experiment. It, it ceases to work when you don't have the polymer wall above the aluminium foil. It, you just end up with normal breaking up of the aluminium foil. You don't end up with these beautiful yin-yangs everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you go and look at the ultra uh, uh, presentation I gave a couple of years ago in uh, Azizi, I show another experiment which is done in free air where they have a transducer above and then a solid metal plate below and they inject uh, some glycol fluid and it, at the standing wave nodes it produces a yin and a yang sphere and when some of them explode and the fluid goes down into the next sound field uh, resonant uh, 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 standing wave it goes in with a spiral galaxy into each side of these uh, yin yang structures. And that's in free air. You take that thing away, and all you do is when you drop the uh, the glycol or whatever it is into the sound field, it just falls to the ground. <laughs> you need wow. the sound. Sound. So, I think what's happening is possibly you're actually getting with the particles that are in there. The sound is actually momentarily creating a resonant node between a, a particular piece of metal. <laughs> <laughs> and and the sound field coming in between a few cycles. I think mm. if you do what I'm saying, and you do get it in resonance, and it would be a case of depending on the fluid temperature and so on, and I would imagine ultimately that as the temperature of the fluid moves up, you would have some feedback loop that would move the reflector up and down to account for the change of the speed of sound in the working fluid. So you would keep it on tuned on resonance to keep the sound resonant field in there. Um, and I, would, I wouldn't I would be anywhere near the room because if my understanding is correct, you're, you're going to get a lot more neutrons than you were getting spuriously. <laughs> okay. Um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near it. <laughs> and I, oh, I, I would look for hot I things later. Like um, yeah, so it's very rare that you see this beautiful array of thousands and tens of thousands of these yin yangs all over the aluminium foil when you just have it floating on the top of the water mm -hmm. it's just it, it and so like when you're cleaning jewelry ordinarily you haven't got these standing mm -hmm. waves in the in the cleaner so it's it's only getting rid of the dirt using the re-entrant jets okay mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. and re-entrant jets are just chance bubble creation that then decays it's not resonance it's not when you have this resonance it builds and it builds and it builds and so when we had thin aluminium foil we're synthesizing typically uh carbon and or, and it might be from fusion fission or whatever we're getting carbon and and calcium and so on uh when we're having the thick foil that alan goldwater did we end up synthesizing the iron okay I'm happy to stop at iron. We have apparently synthesized silver. I don't know. But 
Um, I don't want to have th thick, thick aluminium foil and enough sound to achieve the resonance to get the kind of things that were claimed by Leclerc. So um, I th I'm, I'm quite happy to stop at silver or iron <laughs> as a synthesized product. Now, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, yes, you added D2. I think, I, think, I think I've covered most of my thoughts on the work. I mean, brilliant work. Um, Thank you. I did suggest to you um, that maybe if you have water um, and it would need this reflector for it to work, in my view, um, uh, if you could use lithium chloride, you are the most appropriate person to uh, do an experiment to see if Cladoff was correct in the use of lithium chloride as a means of producing uh, what yeah. I believe is lithium-10, which then immediately decays to... Uh, lithium-9 with the production of a neutron. It might be a very much quicker way, but I don't see in the cu current apparatus that it will work without having that reflector and in the right resonant location. It's a good idea, good suggestion. I'll try it. Okay, so um, excellent work. Um, uh, is there anything else you want to add? No, uh, I just uh, hope I'm not <laughs> going to be uh, held back by preconceived ideas and be more attentive and open-minded uh, uh, all i can no, say all but, i can say is just put out your ideas whether they're right or wrong keep publishing the data on a regular cycle um say what you did when you did it and and it, you'll be surprised what the crowd can come up with in terms of things that you're not you're not maybe considering that's a very good suggestion maybe that's what i will start doing um so yeah um thank you very much for your time and uh, can I have your face here again? You kill that. <laughs> can uh, I what? Uh, face again? Yeah, okay. your face, yes. Uh, do you see me? Uh, you, well, kill your sharing. Yes, I should see you. You look beautiful. All right, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> All right, so can I ask you, I, I, I have decided to have this around my neck the whole time, which is ah. it's not a Tesla logo, although Tesla logo is a more accurate version of what this is. This is the Ukan of Asara. It's a symbol of the spin shift this is the top of the monopole it's the difference between the vortex and the anti-vortex in a magnetohydrodynamic structure okay um and it is the most powerful thing in the universe what i see around there is a sun wheel which is effectively the part of the structure but sliced through this angle <laughs> Mm -hmm. As far as I understand it, yeah, this is uh, called color rock. Mm -hmm. This is the solar symbol. Yeah, and I uh, interpret it as a symbol for energy, so I wear it to have energy. <laughs> so the f hilarious thing is, is if you take the normal through that structure there, that is the bit that sits above it. It's actually down um, in in the center of the structure, but it's it, this. It, you, this is actually the mushroom in mm. the birdie. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, I just think I found it amusing that you had that round your neck. Slavic symbol, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it, the thing is, um, I think these uh, the Slavics had a really good understanding, and and the Nordics had a really understanding of how nature works, and uh, hopefully we can catch up with them at some point in the next uh, millennia. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. I'm going to well, stop the recording. I appreciate everything. <laughs>